President Mario Monti, Rector uh, Gianmara Verona, Mayor Sala, rectors, members of the academic body, students, alumni, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's a real honor and privilege to be here today and I want to thank you all for giving me such a warm welcome, especially to the rector, Gianmara Verona, of this prestigious university. But above all, thank you to your president, Mario Monti. Mario, you've given to Europe more than Europe can ever repay to you. And um, I had the experience myself of one day thinking, what's the really important thing that I have to do during my tenure? And that thing was about finding the next president of the European Research Council. Jean-Pierre Bourguignon is at the end of his tenure, and I had this job to do, which is like to keep the institution this amazing place. You know, the European Research Council that you've just saw the video, and you had these wonderful professors here, is really the best place in the world. In 10 years, we got in between medal fields and um, Nobel Prizes more than 10 people. And one day I was at the Nobel Prize, and Ben Feringa, who won the Nobel Prize, he told me I could never have a Nobel Prize if I had not had before European grants from the European Research Council. And I said, why? And he said, you know, because Europe is the only place in the world that people still believe in the intuition of science. And that's really unique. And, and I thought, how can I do this? And, and so I decided to call Mario. And Mario, with um, everything he has to do, he decided to accept to be the person that will choose and select the next president of that institution. So Mario, publicly, I really wanted to thank you for that, um, for being there at moments that at the top we feel lonely, and so I felt less lonely because I have you there. But we, uh, with Mario Monti, our story has this uh, great friend of ours, um, Antonio Borges, who unfortunately passed away and Antonio uh, was part of this university, um, as Mario Monte described. And I was working with Antonio Borges at that time in the year 2000. And I remember that uh, he was so excited. He really loved Bocconi. He was probably one of the best economists I've met and my mentor, but he was one of the most optimistic persons I've met in my life. And at some point, he, he was so focused on, on Bocconi and doing, I think, that report that you just mentioned, that I asked him, Antonio, what is that so special about Bocconi? And he said, you know, Carlos, Bocconi is a place where dream and detail intersect. And I didn't get it at the time. I was very young. But then it became, in my mind, over the years, this idea of the dream and the detail. And um, one day I was reading the biography of Steve Jobs, a great book by Walter Isaacson, and everything made sense to me. When he tells an amazing story about Steve Jobs, he tells that when Steve Jobs was very young, uh, the father asked him, Steve, you have to paint uh, the fence around the house and uh, Steve did it. He went on, he painted the whole fence around the house, but there was a little bit of the fence in the garden that was hidden. It was behind a tree. So Steve never painted that part. And the father came and said, Steve, you know, you have to paint the whole fence, even that part that is hidden behind the tree. And Steve told the father, but dad, nobody will ever see it. And that answer, yes, nobody will see it, but you will know about it. And when the first Macintosh was about to go and be sold, Steve Jobs went to look at the engineers and they looked inside. You remember the Macintosh was this box, right? A beautiful computer. And he looked inside in the chipboards and the wires were all messed up. And he looked at the engineers and said, you have to fix this because the details are very important 
because the details are everything. And they said, no, Steve, it doesn't really make any sense because nobody will ever see it is inside the computer. And Steve said, but you will know about it. And they delayed the shipment for six weeks until they fixed all the wires inside of the computer so it looked beautiful. And the point is that, you know, you cannot dream if you don't get the details right. You cannot transform your dreams in reality if you don't know the detail. They will still dreams, and a lot of people have dreams. But the job of a university, the job that you have here as professors, is to focus the minds of these students on the detail so one day they can transform that detail into a dream. And Jim Schnab is the chairman of Siemens, says something that I think is so important. He says, details is about practicing every day in order to get to that dream. And uh, two years ago, uh, I was uh, in Germany, and um, there was President Barack Obama, which I think is really one of these really unique characters in politics that gets it everything right. He got the details and the dream, and he was talking to uh, students, and uh, he went on and said something that puzzled everybody. He looked at the young people, as I'm trying to do, looking like back, the ones up there, and he said, if you had to choose a moment in time to be born, any time in human history, and you didn't know ahead of time what nationality you were, or what gender, or what economic status might be, you would choose today. And so today I wanted to talk exactly about that, about something that uh, Jamari Verona also mentioned. Why is the time that we live today exceptional? The second thing I wanted to tell you that you should not take that for granted. And the third, I wanted to talk about the role of the young generation, what you have ahead of you. So first, why are we living in such an exceptional time? Why do we have this exceptional time, but at the same time we have people that tell you about the good old days? This mythical time when things were so much better than they are now. And it's true, I mean, if you look around, you have all these crises. President Juncker calls it the poly crisis. Brexit, the refugees, the terrorism, the financial crisis. But Hans Rosling, in his book, Factfulness, he shows that that good old days really never existed. I was thinking about your university. This university was established in 1902, so more than 100 years ago. More than 100 years ago, life expectancy was 30 years old. Today, half of the ones that are on the top there sitting, the younger ones, will live beyond the age of 100. 100 years ago, 15% of the population used to die of violence and war. This university exists because the child of a man died in the war. Imagine that. Today, less than six to eight people per 100,000 die of violence and war. Even our intelligence, I was reading the other day that in the 1950s, when, you invented, when we invented the IQ test, the average of people passing that test was 100. Today, if you would pass that test, the average would be 120. And of course, in this room will be much above that, I think 140 or 150. But it's not just the life expectancy that is improving. Our quality of life has changed dramatically. And so we ask why, what is the reason for that? And the reason is science, is innovation, is technology. There's no other reason. And in one way, it's thanks to the fact that we have changed from this paradigm where everything went slowly to a paradigm that we are connected. 
And as a Portuguese uh, myself, I love stories of explorers. And you only think about what science did. I mean, in the 1400s, we were nothing. The Chinese had all the technology. And then the Portuguese and the Spanish, with smaller boats, with less technology, went and discovered the world. Magellan, he went around the world in three years. If he lived today, he would do it in three days. But more than that, he could do it just flying around with a solar plane, like Bertrand Piccard did it. Bertrand Piccard is a Swiss guy, and I just wanted to mention that because he's one of these like you that get the detail and the dream right. Bertrand decided at some point that he wanted to go around the world in a solar plane. And people thought he was crazy. His friends told him, no, why would you do that? It's impossible. He went to the big builders of planes like Boeing and Airbus the big boys, and he said, look, I want to go around the world and I want to do it in a solar plane. And they said, that's impossible. It's gonna be too heavy and too big. You're not gonna be able to do it. And Bertrand, he told me that story. He said, no, no, I really want to do it. So he went to a friend that was a boat builder that used to build boats. And he said, look, I want to build a plane that is solar energy. And the boat builder, his friend, did it. And I asked Bertrand, but how was it possible? And he said, you know, but my friend did know it was impossible. And I think that that amazing way of looking into the future of people that because they go into the detail, but they're not afraid of the impossible, that's the way the world is changing. But our era is also exceptional because freedoms that today we take for granted were there for us. 30 years ago, a wall divided Berlin in two. Before the Schengen Agreement, there were border controls all over in Europe. Today, there's 1.7 million people that cross the borders of Europe every day to work in between the countries. You know, my father was a journalist in the 70s in Portugal, and uh, he was not free to write what he wanted because the censorship, the authoritarian regime lasted until the 70s. Can you imagine a Europe like that? You cannot. Fortunately, you cannot. Your world is much better, but let me tell you, don't take it for granted. You know, before the British referendum on Brexit, I used to come to this talks and say to people, you know, the European project is irreversible. That day I realized that it was not. That we have to fight every day. That we have to explain to people that problems that we have today cannot be solved in one country. You imagine how strange it is? You talk about climate change. Do you think climate change looks at borders? Pollution looks at borders? Cyber attacks, they have no borders. Yet, the political discourse is about people that sell you the dream that borders will solve it. So remember, especially the younger ones, do not take it for granted. So the big question for you as a generation, the ones that I'm talking to, is what's your role in the world? What do you want to do? And each generation has to face its own unique challenges. Each generation must renegotiate the world of tomorrow. And your generation is no exception. So what is the challenge? You know, I have kids of um, young age, one about to go to university. And I think that your generation, the younger one, it's so much better. In my generation, my parents just wanted me to have a job, go to university, have, have a job. Today is so different. Your generation wants to feel something, wants to feel that you want to change something in the world. 
And when I look at your generation, sometimes, let me tell you, I feel jealous because your eyes will see amazing things that I will not see. Technology is growing at a tremendous pace. Every day new innovations come and people don't even know about it. You know, the other day while I was at Delft University and I saw one of the first quantum computers in the world. And you know, today there's so many problems that we would like to solve and we think that we can solve it by increasing the speed. So we created the supercomputers, but the supercomputers will not be able to solve problems that do not depend on how fast you solve the equations. There are problems today that do not depend on that. That's where quantum will come into play because quantum is different. It is this puzzling idea that a particle can be zero and one at the same time. You know, Einstein was himself confused by this idea. But if a number can be zero and one at the same time, or a number can be two numbers at the same time, then the problems that your generation will solve will be so different from my generation. In Delft, they, they did something that I think is such a beautiful thing that I don't resist to tell you this story. Einstein, when he, in 1915, he said, you know, that this phenomenon in quantum, that two particles can move in the same direction, zero or one, without any link in between them. But he thought he was wrong. In Delft last year, they proved that Einstein was right. This is called entanglement. It means that if you have two particles that we will move in the same direction without no link, it means that your problems of cybersecurity, that today the hackers get into the middle of these two particles because they hack the channel. If there's no channel in between these two particles because they move exactly in the same direction, then cybersecurity will be a different story. And those things, I think that your generation will look back and think, how is it possible that those people in the years 2000 were so worried with these problems like cybersecurity that now with the quantum, it's totally easy to solve. The same way we look back to other generations and I think, how was it possible to have a world without the internet? And you will look back and you say, how is it possible to have a world without quantum? Because the physics, the classical physics, that just explain the big things. The quantum physics explain the very small things. But at the same time, I'm also afraid for your generation. Because I think that technology has gave us so much economically, will change so much. But at the same time, technology is separating us from the concept of democracy. And this is affecting our way of life like never before. Some why this relationship we have with the machine has globalized the economy, but somehow has localized politics. And somehow we feel lonely behind the screen. And I think that your challenge will be to find purpose for every human being. What is our purpose? Technology has changed everything and suddenly we became politically like tribes. But the problem of tribes is that tribes don't want to reach consensus. Tribes are not designed for that. So we supposedly have more information and when I watch a YouTube or I go to Netflix, I just see what I want to see. They choose for me the things that I think I want to see. And so in an age of information, I have less information. I have less choice. So that's the problem, is that it's ironic that we now have so much variety of information at our finger trims, 
but we have really no choice. And it's, as an engineer, I always find this so compelling and so different because as an engineer, I always thought that if you would create a machine, that machine will make you somehow a more rational person. But no, we are becoming more emotional, more tactile, because democracy is physical and digital is not. Because democracy was a centralized physical process with borders, with hierarchies, and the digital is decentralized, is non-geographical, is data-driven. So your generation will be the ones that will make these choices. The choice of what will be technology. Do I want technology and artificial intelligence to replace me? No. I want technology to get me to be a better person, to complement me. I want algorithms to be transparent, to give me real choice. I want data that is not biased. I want data to be part of my dignity as a person. So technology for humanity is your call. That will give each person a purpose. But you might think, why me? That's a job for the politicians. No, my friends, that's a job for every one of you. That will be your job, to be able to change the world that way, to make that political choices, because this is not about technology. This is about politics. And you have to get more involved in politics. You know, that's what I feel, is that the world changed so much, but finally, it's about people. It's about being able to, at some point, changing the way you do things in life. And that's what Bakoni will do for you, is to prepare you for that change. In the 19th century, one day, a well-known businessman sat down for his breakfast. He was a chemist and a businessman and an inventor, and over coffee, he read the morning newspaper and he was astonished to see the picture in the front page of himself. It was his obituary. Immediately he knew that he had confused him with his brother. The news was saying that he died. And it was terrible. They called him the merchant of death, the dealer of destruction. So he immediately called for his carriage to take him and change his will. That new will established the Nobel Peace Foundation and that man was Alfred Nobel. So the story tells me that it's never too late to change, that one person alone really can do it, because our destiny is in our control. We always have the power to turn back, to step aside, to do something different. But Bacconi gives you that amazing opportunity to follow your passions, to change the course of your life, of learning the detail, so that you can transform your dreams into reality. Don't be afraid. Go for it. You know, if you do it, people will follow you. That's what I wish to you. That's what I wish to Bacconi. I wish you the greatest luck for your future. As a commissioner, I really ask you to take care of the future of Europe in everything you do. You know, Drew Faust, the rector of Harvard University, when students arrive, you'd say, the key part of any success is the part of you that is willing to fail. So do that. Be willing to fail to be successful. And that will change your life forever. Thank you very much.